So, good evening. Um, um, tonight, um, we have invited uh, Jonathan and Stephen to present their film's work. As you probably know, they are teaching Optional Studio this term, and an Optional Studio with a focus on housing, the, the Dunlop Studio. The, the focus on housing is uh, and on a specific typology, the tower type, is not uh, an innocent uh, election in their case, as, as happens with mostly all their decisions. Uh, also to attach such, such an abstract um, type or generic typology to different cities and try to extract some conclusions of the relationship of a specific city and uh, this typology. But, 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 but let's, let's begin, I mean, with order. Um, they studied at the Architectural Association and the Royal College of Art in London. <coughs> After working for architects like Tony Fretton on, or David Chipperfield, they established their own firm in 1996. Both of them have been involved in teaching in many European excellent schools as the AA, Architectural Association, or the EPFL of Lausanne, and now are professors in Mendrisio and the Technische Universität in Munich, uh, with offices open in London and Zurich and work that has expanded in time from local to global, uh, relative global practice, very much focused in, in European countries, as far as I know. Numerous awards and recognitions have been accumulated in time. RIBA awards, Premios FAD, Miss van der Rohe nominations, Henry Stesenhoff gold medal, Eric Schelling medal. And um, finally, they have constructed a solid body of theoretical work with a long series of articles and books, as well as an interesting monographs on their work, all of them crafted with very special care. I mean, the special care they put on everything they deal with. It's not easy to introduce their work, as it's not easy to enjoy their aesthetics at first glance. I mean, uh, so to speak, they, <laughs> they, no, and it's true. I mean, this is a very, very obvious characteristic of their work. No, I mean, so to, so to speak, they do not care about becoming uh, uh, um, iconically recognized, uh, uh, mediatically successful. I mean, their approach is at odds of these others that we are used to see, many of them coming from London, I must say, that are concentrated in iconic and that's, um, sometimes amazing forms. I mean, this doesn't mean that I am in favor or against. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of good architecture, not, not um, of bad architecture. I don't mind. I mean, but they come from another British tradition. Uh, uh, a tradition that has grown with other references, very much uh, rooted in everyday life and in looking to the cities we have heritated, looking carefully to them. A tradition that finds in the Smithsons, obviously, a very precise reference. This, this fertile tradition is at odds with the simplification that means to reduce architectural objects to the, let's say, I can say the corporate architecture division among an impressive envelope and a banal structure with interior spaces made as a collage of cliches. Their work is truly three-dimensional in the sense that of trying to create consistency with every single square meter, every room, uh, being it located uh, out or in, interior, in, in the interior space. Housing has become a kind of a speciality for them and a focus of their academic interest in pedagogy in understanding that working on residential structures, those that are 90% of the built environment, uh, is an amazing uh, exercise to understand deeply the complexities of our profession. But this doesn't mean that they do not care about mm, others' work or they are like uh, isolated from the cultural panorama, uh, or about what we can call the panorama of our profession. I think that a good clue to understand their work is not only this idea of the ordinariness and everyday life aesthetics, uh, the memories of our cities and building materials and so on, uh, but a deep sense of what I could, I mean, I want to call provocation that their work has 
almost uh, as a hidden agenda, precisely because it remains stubbornly, and stubborn is another word, uh, another word that fits perfectly well with their work, remains stubbornly indifferent to the mainstreams we have become used to admire. They are virtuosi of other way, ways to understand the impact of our work, reflected in the temporal dimension and in the respect for the city fabric as such, as an immense collective work developed in time that needs to be listened, experienced, seen with a profound respect before any other decision or agenda one can bring. In my opinion, um, there is a serious understanding of the meaning of the notion of material culture in their work. Combine it with a radical sense of provocation. Radical in the etymological sense is radical because it goes to the um, roots, to the radice, uh, the origins and sense of our historical, typological, and material patrimonies, understood as the main references of uh, an architect uh, has to deal with if he or she pretends to have a sense of time of the city as a collective cultural construction. Uh, let me read, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm frequently make this, the titles of their texts and books, and that give a kind of resume that is much better than my words. It's for, uh, a few of them, buildings, a title. Feeling at home, inside, outside, permanence, modernism as a contemporary vernacular. Ten more rooms, my favorite. I like this title. <laughs> the, the City of Things, Resistance, and the other favorite, Learning from Looking at Buildings. I think that, I mean, to resume and to finish my presentation, uh, time to make visible time is the last characteristic I want to underline uh, in this introduction. Time is the other version of a space, the other side of the leaf. No? Every space, every construction, every building is made of this immaterial matter that acts as a secret agent, agent of our profession. How, I mean, the question is how many buildings last no more than one summer as, as if they were uh, the last song by Lady Gaga? No? C can we become, I mean, what I see in their work is, is this question, no? can we become truly popular, and not attending just the need of media for the spectacular, for surprise, shock, originality? Is it possible to construct nowadays consistency, physical consistency, but also temporal consistency, remaining stubbornly, again, rooted in our material culture, trying to add small contributions to the patrimony constructed in time? Uh, I think that uh, it's not easy to respond, but it's always refreshing and, and seriously interesting to pay attention to architects as Sergison and Bates that truly believe, or at least is my interpretation, that this is the most important contribution we can make to navigate in our world and to give some light, some moments of light in it. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan and Stephen. <laughs> Thank you, Inyaki. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a real pleasure to be here at the GSD. Thank you, Moise, and thank you, Inyaki, for this great opportunity. The title of our lecture is On Continuity, and it is in two parts. I will uh, start, here I am, um, addressing aspects of our practice, really, as a teaching and practical practice. And Jonathan will follow with a series of uh, commentaries on current and recently completed work. I think we'll be, we'll be about half an hour each. So if you need to plan your evening. Um, my lecture is intended as an outline of my active and theoretical participation in architecture. It has an autobiographical dimension offered to you, the audience, as an insight into the evolution of a position, the position of an architect, the position of a teacher. The focus is on housing and living because this is at the center of my teaching, a worthy and appropriate theme given its importance in the built landscape 
and my own experience of 20 years or so. I am a devotee of European cities and drawn towards the normative program of housing, giving the very structure and indeed the origins of any city. The European city demonstrates the best possibilities of the relationship of the individual and the greater whole, the bringing together of people for mutual benefit and support of each other. It also demonstrates the coexistence of different layers of history and embodies a level of continuity. And this becomes the first reference to the title of this lecture, for as Ernesto Nathan Rogers state, stated in 1957 in the Casabella essay, Continuity, continuity does not signify a linear one after the other system, but rather an interpretation of time in which the past continues to exist in the present and the present is therefore determined by it. We all have a relationship with the city and from the mixing together of personal autobiography and civic history, the identity of ourselves as architects emerges. It is impossible to remove the subjective and the emotional from the city and I favor a balance between the analytical and the narrative when considering how cities are and how they should be. Here I refer to the critical observations of Peter Smithson in Bath, Patrick Keeler in the urban periphery of London, and the work of the artist Richard Wentworth. The following references relate to our own, to our own work. To focus the teaching on the act or art of inhabitation is appropriate because it holds the essential in architecture. It forms the basis of urbanity and the background atmosphere of living, of possible happiness and comfort. It has codes and conventions that need to be learned and understood and then later challenged intelligently. It is an architecture of the center ground and I have a lot of experience working in it, within it. Jonathan and I have a lot of experience working within it. From the scale of the house in the city center to the strategy plan of the urban hinterland. Victim of recession, mantle of economic recovery, tool of political maneuvering, always subject to the vagaries of the local situation, protective neighbors, outdated planning policy, and the unending amount of regulation. But amidst all that is the built space, the room, the wall, the space between. These have a more stabilizing underlying character and represent the components to be utilized in those never ending questions. What should the character of this room be? How should it feel? How do we form a window? How do we use the ground floor? How do we renew our thinking about the collective? To work out how our buildings should face the city to express the material and then beyond the building itself, beyond its texture, weight and scale, but also to reinforce, it, reinforce its representational role, making a coherent language of construction. This remains the challenge and forms the basis of an education, a journey towards personal artistic identity and social responsibility. I like Snotzi's reply to a question about the responsibility of an architect, that it is to replace the value of the land in which he or she is intervening on, to first recognize what that value is, needs guidance and study. This is a house that is special to me and to Jonathan. I pass it regularly and over the years have observed uh, has, have observed it carefully. It seems to represent that charged expression of individual ownership while at the same time being an intrinsic part of the city and the street. It is called Shandos House and was designed by Robert Adam in 1771. It was the first of a series of large townhouses built speculatively by the Portland estate. 
and so with no specific owner or client. The building is nearly 250 years old, but can still be read with a measure of modesty and sobriety, but with a powerful physical presence, with its facade of Craigleth stone. It seems to perfectly fulfil its role as a house in the city, which is different to that of a monument or public building. It becomes an instructive model for thinking about proportion and the image of buildings, demonstrating a strategy of tolerant ordering. It is formal and dignified, but also displays a carefully measured series of adjustments to convention that give the building a unique character. For example, the offset entrance porch, the unequal window spacing, not immediately apparent, but adding to a feeling of looseness. The setting out of horizontal bands relating to proportion and structural representation at odds with the convention of classical ordering. And yet, it also embodies the origins of a dilemma that manifested itself much later, that of the tension between housing as a provision and housing as a commodity. Since the 70s, one can observe, observe a dramatic shift of ownership from the public sector towards a greater private ownership, bringing with it the notion of the house or home as a commodity. Housing as a provision has been somehow usurped by the house as a commodity, something that could be traded. I think that this has limited the extent to which the house has developed culturally or been much part of a cultural debate. More people live alone than in a family, and yet the house is overwhelmingly planned to accommodate the family group. It seems reasonable, therefore, to say that there is a mismatch with the contemporary house and the society it is intended to accommodate. There is also a fundamental difference between the house and housing. One is concerned with exclusion and privacy, a, a self-sufficient social entity, and the other has the implicit intention of housing for all without the responsibility of ownership. I think it's interesting to seek credible building types which make a contemporary union between dwelling and the urban condition. The seeking of a relationship between use and space is uncommon in school or practice beyond a functional discussion, and I feel that this needs to be addressed. I identify with Ross's observation that form persists and comes to preside over a built work in a world where functions continually become modified. The legacy of modernism is the quest for the minimal dwelling. This lies at the heart of public housing and sustainable development. The study of Alexander Klein here demonstrates this tendency. But what it often means is that we have bigger and bigger buildings comprising smaller and smaller rooms. Equally, spaces for access are too easily ascribed as functional, holding to the rule of the minimal, with the consequence that these important representational spaces of possible varied use are mean and hold little opportunity. In big residential buildings, we experience little sense of promenade or of wandering through. These two projects from our office show a challenge to this condition, one in Wandsworth, an extension of an existing building where the route to your apartment is via an external covered way and secondly, in Vienna, where the entrance to each of the three buildings is via a generous public loggia space. I'm inspired by these following pictures. The first, woman, women embroidering, from the mid-16th century by Giovanni Stradano. Sounds Italian, but he was Belgian. He liked Italy so much he changed his name. It depicts the Italian quarto, part of a larger house assigned to a family or part of a larger household. Spacious enough to accommodate people and furniture. I see nine people visible in this picture. The room seems to be self-sufficient and there is an atmosphere of conviviality. I'm intrigued by the generosity of the room, the niche, the space beyond, the changeable character, all dictated by occupation. 
also. Oops. Interior with Lady playing the virginal from 1665 by Emmanuel de Witt, one of the Delft painters, so 100 years later. It depicts another domestic situation, like a vignette. The room before us has no clearly defined function. Is it a bedroom or a music room? It is one room in a series with interconnected doors. Certainly it reveals aspects of du Dutch domestic culture, the ground floor being semi-public, shoes kicked off at the bottom of the stairs, the practice of washing the stoop, all defining home as special and private. And the farmhouse kitchen, which appears in a scientific autobiography by Aldo Rossi, the material of the room giving it great softness. The spatial variety in character, the setting, the hierarchy of space overuse, evident in these pictures, suggests ways of finding new interpretations in counterpoint to the mainstream direction in housing. By the 20th century, function dominated house planning, seemingly above and beyond moral codes with often negative consequences squeezing the life out of the kitchen as a convivial place, for example. So functionality, anthropometrics, ergonomics, removed any wasteful space, but brought also spatial impoverishment. Don't get me wrong, Christine Frederick's three-way kitchen was an important step towards certain aspects of domestic comfort, but by no means answered the question of what comfort might really be. Central to my interest, therefore, is the spatial potential of the plan and section, of course. And to make it a more explicit area of investigation, act, in act, and, act, sorry, investigation and activity in schools of architecture, this is an apartment plan of some, fr of some friends of ours in Oporto. It gives me such inspiration. I often use it to convince and talk to clients about the value of the middle room, the room with no immediately obvious use. Investigation should start, therefore, with a closer familiarity and observation of the work of others. If we look, for example, at Roger Diener's Casa A1 at the Olympic Village in Turin from 2003, we see a kind of mental ordering, putting trust in the conventions of orthogonal space, a conceptual approach that is embedded also in a construction idea, the plan being divided into widths defined by the tunnel form construction. The layout allows a flexible exchange of spatial units rather than a conventional and unambiguous arrangement of functions within each apartment. Whether the rooms are designated for living or sleeping, or a loggia or a kitchen to be installed later, all are interchangeable. It is a spatial chain of interconnected chambers which even finds its expression in the urban plan. In a very different way, observing the evolution of the plan of Koderk's Barcelonetta housing for mariners from 1952 through his sketches, we see how he overworks his original orthogonal plan through the pursuit of the diagonal view, which, once it is set in his mind, became the organizing force for the finished plan. It forced small scale, sm it, it, forced, uh, it forced small inventions in his plan, such as the double swing door between the private parts of the house. And in fact, this marked a complete change of direction in relation to Kodirk's pursuit of architecture. The plans of the Italian Milanese architect Cascia de Mignoni are made seemingly by an instinctive forming of space from the inside, following no obvious conventions except for a pursuit of comfort and protocol. The multi-sided room, inner hallway, and multiple routes through space, doors placed on the diagonal, all contribute to this casual but highly controlled approach. 
I find these arrangements experienced by visiting them so inspiring. They reinforce my insistence to work with models to design spatially and less through two-dimensional constraints of a plan on a computer. Dominioni's generosity and lack of dogma allows the integration of everything that forms the personal identity of the owner. In Bailey Scott's Houses and Gardens, he describes the plans of his houses as an unfolding story. Room upon room are composed and placed together as an act of descriptive thinking. This is how I would like to pursue our work and attempted, as we have done, to do so in the past. For example, in this small project in East London. I revisited the project recently and was reminded that it emerged through a passionate dialogue between client and architect, both of whom were ready to challenge convention. Who would build two staircases on such a small plot? It's 4.2 4 metres by 20 metres deep. Shared reference, spatial planning, not defined by a fixed use, able to be transformed physically and in the mind, still possible to feel lost. And this is a project that was loved, is loved by the owners, even those for whom it was not initially intended. A collection of rooms that gently reconfigure traditional layout and circulation. Perhaps it has the potential to be a prototype for urban living. The constraints of this and any other site becomes a primary aspect in the evolution of the plan. The requirements to adjust and modify makes the plan unique and personified beyond the conceptual starting point. Look, for example, at the post houseman urban plan in Paris to see how the representational arrangement of apartments of the bourgeois become modified, still retaining a level of decorum but becoming unique through external factors. At Wandsworth, <clears throat> the project I showed earlier, the plan surrenders to the given geometry of the building host in which the residential apartments sit on top of. The apartment plan easing, into, uh, easing gently into a reconfigured form. And so my interest is in the evolution and future of the plan considered spatially, and how we might devise an appropriate form of housing within the real-life constraints of practice, in order that housing may become a defining element of the future city. Perhaps in this information-rich age, we can move away from the precision of purpose of the modernist plan, and at an urban scale, it should be possible to consider typologies that have a positive impact on the urban fabric in relation to an expression of houses within the city. Typology remains a useful avenue of investigation, therefore. Can we as architects see ourselves as enablers of future occupants beyond our own time to fit the modest model of the modern house within the greater scale of the city? As a teacher over the years and through trial and error, a methodology emerges. It is about finding a balance between instruction on the one hand and investigation on the other. The intention is always in creating a studio environment of discussion and investigation. Architectural ideas are addressed through the design, through the design project, which is explored through a number of interrelated themes. It is important to bring construction together with emotion, to bring material together with meaning. And we often start with typology. For example, this study <clears throat> of the English terraced house as an urban type, where students learned about the cultural origins and the cultural sort of connection to such a project, its construction basis, and most importantly, its expression of an urban life. So the students visited the buildings but experienced the interior of these projects. 
Therefore, it was vital that they experience this inner atmosphere to understand its relationship to construction. And with another kind of survey, like this incredible project in Munich called the Borstai from 1906, a new familiarity of urban form and the shape of a room are brought together through drawing, because this is a drawing exercise. I always show both images because I never know which one's going to project well enough, so you see both. Um, and you know what was so surprising was when you see this cellular structure, you may associate that with low income, high density, and when you visit the project, you actually see spatial generosity and a comfortable lifestyle. So the surprise is in the spatial luxury of this vastly dense project. To place this kind of typological study within the context of living or the room is always important, and this connects to an idea about being at home in the city. I like to consider the city starting with the room and out to the building, the space between the city block. The Noli plan of 1748 encourages an understanding of the building not as an isolated event, but one that is deeply and intrinsically embedded in the fabric of the city. The light areas of the plan reveal the manner in which the public space in the city is conceived no less carefully than building. And then we see in this comparable figure ground plan the transformation of this as an idea towards the greater autonomy in the modern city of the building object and the loss of definition to the space between these being two different parts of London. I don't need to tell you which is the modern one. <laughs> This picture, my students, or our students already know this picture, but this picture dates from 1663 with the most wonderful title, a boy handing a woman a basket in a doorway by Pieter de Hoog, describes those deep and delicate thresholds that engender our, our everyday existence. I, mean, I do often give a complete lecture of this project and um, because it's a really a discussion about a series of thresholds. And as I describe these thresholds from this chair and this mat to this step down to this outside space, to this step up into the shadows, across to this street, across the canal, and then to the neighbor staring back, I usually get a, ah, but not tonight. <laughs> the observations of, the observation of things remains really Jonathan and my most important formal education. Observation is later transformed into memory, and when combined with some experience and confidence, this becomes the primary initiator of design and the making of form. Looking carefully at windows, how are they placed? How are they made? How does the light fall through them? And what do you see? Drawing leads to a greater understanding and a kind of respect for a seeming, seemingly prosaic and functional piece of carpentry. The measure of a space, its surface, its form, understanding the size of things. If you don't have a tape measure, use your family. This line of questioning lies at the heart of my teaching, our teaching and is an encouragement to look and question all that lies around oneself, not just at the high architecture of the master architects, but to recognize that our own research into architecture should be an everyday occurrence. And as we prioritize the atmospheric qualities of buildings and spaces, as well as the act of construction, we carry out exercises that bring those aspects together, like the remaking of spaces, an act of reconstruction. Take this example, a room with a pinboard, which is a photograph, and a room with a pinboard, which is a photograph of a model of a photograph. There's the model, which is the real one. 
or a corner of a room with a plan chest. The corner of a room with a plan chest and the model of that corner. I mean, this is incredible work of students. It humbles me every time I ever project it up and see it constantly. But constantly, I refer to this reference of Jeff Wall's large-scale backlit <coughs> cyberchrome photographs. The image, firstly, you see here, and the second image is, are two images of how that shot is actually made, revealing the complexity of process for effect. To think spatially, particularly in these days of computer use, to work with models and then to survey the model, and these become the drawings. This excites us. And not only is it important to work at many scales at once, it is even possible to work and draw at one-to-one. -one. At the AA in 1998, Jonathan and I taught first-year students to design and construct a full-size room. It was an attempt to address a deficiency in architectural education as we saw it. We then repeated the exercise at ETH in 2005. Rooms for the display of objects. That was the theme, to display an object that the students would select themselves. Were arranged within an overall spatial matrix, the design of which was agreed by the whole studio. Rooms responded to each other and to the hangar space in which they were inserted. Students undertook rudimentary carpentry, dry lining and plastering courses, and when completed, the spaces were photographed by the students under the tutelage of Helene Binet and David Grandorge. Here you can see a series of pictures. In this case, the students' collection of little milk tops became the subject of her work. And so, broadening the field of reference for each student, equipping them with useful skills for production, and encouraging them to see what they do within an architectural and historic culture, empowers them to make the first few statements of intent, like this project in Milan. Sorry. Underlying everything is to instill an understanding that there is a culture of architecture and that we are part of a lineage. Our profession has a language and a grammar of form making. It is both an acquisition of knowledge and a process that needs to be absorbed and observed. It is important as a teacher to facilitate a wide field of reference and to encourage a greater trust in the students themselves of their own experience of real things and the continual development of that experience. We emphasize to our students that everything has an origin, and it's worth thinking about that. My own origins lie in London. This street scene is a product of a culture that embodies the picturesque combined with the mercantile. The city environment becomes a rich source of reference. Habitual movement and daily encounters inform our teaching and practice. In London, one, one becomes very aware of an inherent <coughs> tolerance that exists at many levels. Built on the cheap, pragmatically built by individual speculation where the greatest value was intrinsic to the land itself and not to the structure erected upon it. But the picturesque aspects, an English idea of composition and a fascination of nature and remaking of it. An artistic construct, yes, but one that gives much of the city a moving and delicate dynamic. So it isn't diagrammatic, but specific. I bring that London with me when I work in other situations. Just as my autobiography is built on the ideas of others, ideas that dawn on you as an epiphany and still do, those ideas of others. The ideas, for example, of Venturi, absorbed at a pivotal point in our development in the late 80s with his provocation that architecture was primarily about form and social action, that 
one needed to look more closely at existing typologies and at the city, and that cultural continuity was okay. Complexity and Contradiction, his book, suggested that typology was still useful to rediscover a purpose and a place for architecture in the city. Buildings that employ normal construction techniques to extraordinary artistic ends. Work that develops a critical attitude towards building in the city. Continuity meant neither repetition of the old past or a prolongation of post-war modernism. Another source of inspiration, Tessanal, whose House Building and Such Things essay we discovered coincident when we were lucky enough to win the Tessanal Gold Medal for Architecture. His statement that the more we recognize the uniformity of our work and the less we require our work to be entirely new, the more refined it will become, was very instrumental in our thinking. He showed how the simple house could be elevated to the status of a type. Window became emblematic in a laconic way, but highly controlled between pragmatics and feeling. And thirdly, the Smithsons, who referred to ordinary objects with a certain tenderness, their writings connected to emotions, the deeply subjective and atmospheric. In particular, the diary that mainly Alison Smith, Smith, Smithson wrote for um, the weekend house, which was called the Solar Pavilion or Upper Lawn. Highly personal document about living surrounded by nature, suggestive of how architectural space is appropriated once a building is completed and everyday life begins. You know, this book was so, such an influence on us when we first saw it. It was a kind of first view of how to describe architecture. And it helped us in, in the decision of what level to pitch our architecture, even though maybe now we're moving a little bit away from that. And Joseph Frank, recent, more recently perhaps, but that, and, and the looseness and open-endedness open of Joseph Frank's house plans of rooms and connecting spaces so much more interesting than the spatial determinism of Adolf Loos, his kind of contemporary. Frank's position was interesting that he opposed this totalizing effect of modernism and its attempts to codify everything. And when I read that, then I realize, ah, where does his ideas come from? Those are the English arts and crafts, the repose and restfulness, the hierarchy of details, the atmosphere of the ingle nook and the important relationship to the garden. All of those, they came from my new hero, Mackay Hugh Bailey Scott. On Continuity was the title of the last 9H. 9H was a wonderful um, enterprise involving public publishing as well as exhibitions spanning between 1985 and 1991. And it brought the work of emerging architects to audiences in London. Jonathan and I began to connect with this sort of European context. It was a trickle-down effect. It led to our own enterprise with colleagues that was, has been turned papers on architecture from 94 to 95. One of the members of that group, I understand, is giving a lecture here in two days' time. And our practice emerged from these beginnings where reflection and construction go hand in hand. And now we work in many countries from Chile to China and Belgium to Iberia. And our central concern is how to engage cultural significance and construction. It starts by observing place, by mediating, by transforming. And I observe in our work how the transfer of ideas, like, for example, Schinkel here, merges with, for example, with observations of place to initiate an idea about form and making, about presence and the rhythm of peers, for example, in this project that Jonathan will describe later, that bring a constantly shifting elevation to these two very large buildings that establish a new urban relationship 
with an existing structure. The expressive power of construction, for example, here, this is a brick pier. Um, brick is often linked with an inexactness with material that we like very much. These brick walls are made with a broken bond, and this is the diagram given to the builder, made by us, in which the number of... Uh, the broken bond is a, is a construction system where no bricks are thrown away. So when you have to cut a brick, you put it back in the pile, but you place it back in the wall within given constraints, and this is the diagram that defines that. The consequences, though, is that you get an intensity of material because the regular joint it disappears. And this is the kind of interest we have, and we think it's and achieve it despite the prosaic program of multiple housing within a highly regulated and economically driven industry. And in this, there is a tolerance which becomes a sort of useful working concept and strategy. Tolerance gives permissible variation allowing the form to be adjusted to site geometry. It accommodates the contingen contingents of its, of its program and absorbs the realities of building practice. This is an unwrapped elevation of one of three buildings that starts within a, a rigor of a ABAB -A -B rhythm, but is allowed to adjust itself in relation to the plan form and the conditions also behind it within the rooms, um, within a spatially dense situation. And when we consider construction, we talk about tolerance, the shifting layers of claddings and linings and the potential mismatch between the two in response to inside and outside conditions. In a way, our interest almost preempted our knowledge of uh, associated themes that were being explored much earlier than us through Loss and Semper. This project in Belgium for a city library in Blankenberger explored a facade which is curtain-like in the way that folds in a curtain fabric are gathered with repeated undulations which are not quite the same. The facade becomes tolerant to the vagaries of the internal levels of the existing building and site constraints, and yet it is monolithic and whole as a piece finding a language between the monumental status of, status of the existing school building and the everyday character of the adjoining residential buildings. And so tolerance can mean an absorbing and reframing of the existing. In this project in Geneva, you can see it here. <clears throat> we explored a a kind of positive act of mediation between two adjacent architectures. And we did this through the exploration of a tripartite organized facade structure. The tripartite face reconciles the two street situations and it does, does that through its facade of precast concrete. But like the unpredictability and sensual softness of the work of, for example, Oldenburg. Here you can see wedding souvenir from 1960. Great story. This is one piece. This is, there he is, there's Klaus. So he was invited to a wedding of a friend and his idea for the wedding gift was to make, um, I think, <coughs> six or seven cakes, wedding cakes in plaster. Uh, there were four or five moulds out of, and there are 250 slices. And he gave each one to each guest, but you could put them together to make a complete cake. It is in a way a multiple, but each one or each mould, not only each mould is unique, but each, each item of each mould becomes unique. There's a kind of careful carelessness which is adopted, making just in the way as, for example, the softening of this precast uh, pre construction is organized. A careful carelessness, carelessness is adopted to give a uniqueness to the form at many scales, at the scale of the city and the scale of the detail. And so to finish my part of this lecture, I wish to argue for a greater empathy with place, with the situation, with the occupier. 
through the discipline of housing and the investigation into the art of inhabitation, I would wish to explore these fundamentals of an architectural education. A spatial sensitivity to the physicality of the space we occupy in the world. A cultural awareness. The plan, the city, civic history. A building of skills to explore and communicate ideas through models and drawing. A trust in the subjective and in experience. A conceptual understanding of construction. And a trust in continuity. And like Cy Twombly's picture here, a blurring of the boundaries. Do you like that? A blurring of the boundaries between time and place. A register of the sensual and inexactness of life and a precision in the means in which to convey that. So this is the end of my part. Jonathan's coming in. <laughs> I'd just like to add my own word of thank you for the invitation to give this talk this evening. Um, I'm not going to read. I just wonder if I feel like I'm being interrogated here. If those lights could be taken down a little bit. Because I, I suppose I do feel a slight moment of personal panic, but um, Inaki gave such a wonderful and wonderfully provocative introduction. I think the, the notion of ugly and stubbornness is something that I will take with me from that introduction. And I, I also think the, the kind of systematic precision of the, the talk that Stephen's just given leaves me with the difficulty of picking it up. And this is a little bit of an unknown. Well, it, it is known in as much as Stephen and I haven't given a joint lecture for a very long time. And I certainly remember the first time we ever did this, it was at the invitation of Mika Bandini, who I know some people in the audience would know at the time when she was the head of school at North London. And I, I certainly remember another sense of personal panic, which was the moment where Stephen and I, who were doing different things in the morning before we gave a lecture, walked towards each other on the Holloway Road, and we realized that we were wearing <laughs> exactly the same thing, a dark blue T-shirt and light pants. And um, I don't know if we ever pulled it off, but... Um, <laughs> But what I always remember is Mika saying at the end of this first public talk, yeah, you guys have really, you've got to get a position. And I think that takes a long time, but it was wonderful advice. So what I'm going to do is, is really talk about the things that we're working on at this moment in time. I think this is a very deliberately chosen subject to address. It's an attempt to reveal something of the, um, the moment in, in the life of our practice. And what I've done is um, a kind of editing of, of, of that work in as much as I'm really drawing upon the work that deals more explicitly with a sense of urban considerations in our work and certainly the role of housing and the house in the city. It must be also said that in terms of what we're working on at any moment in time very often involves a lot of speculation and specifically the, the competition system which becomes the vehicle to that. Um, unfortunately that also comes with a sense of confidentiality and um, the, the need to protect the authorship of projects. So what I can't really show is uh, those because we'd be disqualified. <laughs> You've seen this image before. I'm going to start by really talking about our work, uh, a collection of projects that we're currently involved in in Belgium, projects that really draw upon our experience of making this building, 
a library in Blankenberger, and this old people's home in a very small settlement <coughs> in Flanders. And really when we talk about our work in Belgium, we're really talking about working in Flanders. And I think a, a, a very, very special architectural culture that we're beginning to understand through our exposure to it. And when we look at these, these houses, they feel both familiar, but in their detail, really quite alien. And Flanders as a place in Europe really feels through a condition of people having an ambition to build their own house, that the whole country has somehow become a suburban continuity. So this is a place where, this is precisely the site where a project that we're currently working on, it's just about to go on site, another old people's home. So in terms of this exploration of housing here, we're talking about housing for the elderly. I must say, in Belgium, that need in society is being addressed in a very direct way. I think in our own country, housing for the elderly is really feeble. This project really looks at, through its formal investigation, the idea of how somehow living as an elderly person within a community of people the building can have a house-like character. And the elements of the house, the pitch roof, which is then repeated again and again, the proportion of a window, the introduction of an element like a chimney, how that sits within a large structure. And the way that within the plan that we've devised, there is an act of sort of cutting into a, a very large form and that in places there is a landscape of uh, internal courtyards. And as an overall description of this project, there is this repeated roofscape, which in terms of its relationship to the elevation becomes one that we look at with a kind of precision in terms of where, of where that act of cutting occurs. Very close to the location of this project is another old people's home that we're also working on, again in a very, very small settlement. And the location of this project requires us to work around um, an existing home which will be demolished, but a very decent church made out of brick that you can see in these model studies at the, the point of the competition are beginning to look at a way that we can work around this inherited element. And at the point of the competition entry, our work was very, very interested in a langu an architectural language that worked with a very clear register of horizontal elements organized around precast concrete panels. But as we looked more carefully at this, this church that we're trying to still maintain some sense of significance to maintain its urban dignity, a shift occurred in, in the way that we proposed the facades for the building. And as you can see in this elevation study, the emphasis becomes much more on the vertical. And like the buttresses of a church, a language of a, of a stepping pier became very much a theme. So these drawings are pretty much current in terms of our thinking and development in this work. And a competition that we won a few months ago is 
um, another project that works with ideas of collective housing, housing for people with uh, the need for support. In this case, a sort of campus that we're involved in, uh, working with a number of other architects as well. And the building that you can see on the screen, which sits between a very decent um, early 20th century house and this larger scale um, building, which is certainly not part of our work, the building in the middle of the image on the screen is a new house for um, uh, adults with um, dementia. This drawing really talks about that sort of campus-like structure that I was describing. And I always have this fear when I pick these up that I don't blind the audience. But that's the building that I was just describing. That's a neighboring building which is outside of the site. And that's a little house. And to the north of this image for a, an, an additional collection of buildings that uh, our colleagues are realizing. So. Our building works with a relationship, but also a, a physical connection to this existing house, one that is made at um, a lower ground level. At the, at the ground level, there's a, a space between which acts as a, a point of, of entry to the re-restored um, um, existing <coughs> house and the entrance to this larger new house. And in plan, we're working very much with an idea of, a, of an orthogonal geometry, but one that adjusts itself in plan as a way of um, breaking up the volume and also uh, reacting to the boundary conditions. This is an image of that building and the relationship that it then tries to establish to the landscape of an, an inherited landscape a park space, and a very much more recent perspective that's looking uh, at a refinement to the ideas of a facade. At this point, from being in Flanders, the journey comes back to the United Kingdom and a project that is currently under construction in the south of England, a project that is exploring what we feel is a very deficient contemporary situation, which is the suburban house and the making of an estate. I must say our own journeys, particularly by train in England, are always so depressing when you look out of a window and you see so many hectares that are covered by um, uh, estate houses. And I think one can be critical of that condition, but I think the best way of dealing with one's criticism is at least to try and work out some kind of reaction to it through our work as architects. And in this project, we're looking at an idea of, of making a new estate of housing where the landscape is really the element that is giving, given the primary, primary um, structure. A landscape that will be arranged around um, a sort of wooded um, environment in which the, tree, um, the, the houses will sit. And the houses themselves are, are all semi-detached houses. In other words, they're, they're double houses. These drawings and, and, and this model is an exploration of the, the formal characteristics of, of these houses. Again, the employment of known elements for chimney, the pit, double pitch roof, and certainly the, the language of brickwork are uh, attempting to deal in a contemporary way with vernacular elements. And this model that talks about the overall organization of a project and the manner in which it works with, in fact, what is a far from sort of bucolic landscape. It's, um, I don't know what it is about the places that Stephen and I are always asked to work in, but um, <laughs> they're never so straightforward because uh, here, as a neighboring condition to our site, is in fact a, a railway line which um, has a, a, 
a sort of five minute impact of intense noise <clears throat> in a place that we hope will be uh, for the rest of the time a place of tranquility. And these plans that talk about the very precisely studied relationship of the volumes and the manner in which hard and, lands hard and soft landscape can be introduced. And then in terms of the plan exploration of this collection of um, different houses which vary between two bedroom to four bedroom houses, um, but always with a, a, a concept of a, a shifted party wall. And the shift is a place in which the staircase is, is housed. So th from the wor a work that is very much dealing with our own English um, culture to a place that is deeply loved, but of course um, alien to us. In this case, um, the landscapes of uh, Alentejo, the region to the east of um, the, city, the Portuguese city of Lisbon. And a work that again deals with ideas of settlement and the relationship of houses one to another. These early studies are sketches that explore the kind of formal spatial characteristics that um, this project is, um, is working with. And this drawing, which places this project within a bigger work, the work of an office in Lisbon who've master planned this project a project that is organized around a central spine, which not only has circulation, but it also, these, uh, these lines of places where vines have been planted. And the, the logic of this project is saying that as a development, the developer wasn't very interested in <coughs> building a golf course because he didn't like golf. And this site is in the middle of Alentejo, not far from Evra. But it's not far, it, it's a long way from the sea. And so what he's introduced is a culture of vines and the production of wine. So the people who will live in the houses in this development can contribute to the growing of grapes and a building which is now realized where the grapes will be converted into wine. Feels like a very wonderful enterprise and one that is um, certainly now beginning to establish itself. But our invitation was to realize 10 houses, which you can see identified here. There's a work of a number of very, very good Portuguese architects, including Jose Paulo dos Santos, Carilla de Gracia and Promontorio, who have a master planning office. And we, along with Peter Meckley, who are, who's building another 10 houses within this project, are very much the invited outsiders. This is a model that talks about the overall organization of the entire project and our contribution to it. This this cluster of 10 houses, the, the discipline of a cluster was very much something that um, the master plan work dictated. And also the sense that each cluster is on a place where the land is slightly higher. And our exploration in this project really draws upon the enthusiasm we have for a very old house type, the Roman courtyard house type. So these early model Studies are exploring an idea for a house that has at its heart an open space, a space of sharing. And in this project of the 10 houses, they work as three different types of differing sizes, but all explore this, this idea of a central space around which the more collective activity of the house can be organized. So a space to gather in, a space to look through and across. Mm. 
the next project I'm going to show draws upon a little bit this recently completed project, a project that very much is situated within the idea of the English landscape. But the landscape for this project, and at this point I'm, I'm very aware that what I'm talking about is a house rather than housing with um, all the differences and discipline that come with that. But a house that um, at the beginning of next year will go on site and a house that sits in a beautiful location in the south of England. Very much a landscape that's made in that picturesque tradition of a seeming naturalness, a sense that the trees that exist within this English estate have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, but in fact have been planted and tended to in a way where that sense of naturalness is uh, not exactly artificial, but um, not as natural as it might propose. So our house, the house that we're making, really draws upon a house type that we have a great enthusiasm for, the Scottish Tower House. The idea of a house that is organized vertically, but explores in a very plastic and spatially very interesting way central spaces, a varying organization of vertical circulation, and then a thick wall which enables niches and secondary spaces to be organized. And our interest also draws upon the idea of the folly, a very picturesque um, building um, strategy, and in this case, the example of the hunting lodge. This project has close by a not exactly fantastic um, main house, but what we really enjoy about this house is the way that it's made through um, the employment of cut flints and the making of a wall. But the very precise location of our house currently has a, um, a concrete water tower and the, the organization, the vertical organization of a building comes from the uh, idea of demolishing this structure and recreating in the, um, the space that it currently occupies a new house. This is a view from the site. And this is a very important moment in the life of this project where, frankly, it would be inconceivable to, building, to build a house in a location like this if there wasn't already a structure there. But we had to work much, much harder to convince um, the local planning authorities that uh, our house had any merit at all and employed or uh, drew upon the support of um, people that... Uh, are deemed by society to have weight and their opinion matters. And they've all got their back to this, um, <laughs> to this image, but certainly Joseph Rigvert is amongst this um, distinguished collection of people who wrote letters of support. The house is organized, as I've already explained, through this sort of vertical concept, but the point that you enter um, is firstly through a courtyard and the idea of a courtyard as a space around which activity occurs was explored not is being explored not only in the Portuguese project but this um, project that we finished a few years ago in um, in North Wales uh, an art center the approach to the house is off a, a small road along a driveway through a gate and these model studies are exploring the construction idea of a house, which is really um, uh, looking at um, an in situ concrete form of construction. So the idea of a model is not only to explore the formal properties of a house, but also this notion of casting. It's important to say to our students who are in the audience, we wouldn't ask you to do things that we don't do ourselves. <laughs> and I think a um, an exhaustive plastic exploration is at, at the very core of the way that we make architecture. This model 
has only one purpose, which is to explore the quality and the interrelationship of the spaces um, inside of the house. Um, as an object, of course, it looks very um, uh, casual or trashy. But what we're exploring is something of the atmosphere and the quality we could observe in this um, castle on the English-Welsh border, the idea of deep niches and a series of plans which are more or less the current status of the project. A ground floor, which is organized around a small annex, a place for parking, the courtyard that I've described that you would come into, and then a hall-like space, which adjacent to it has got a kitchen. And then two staircases. Two, because it creates a spatial variety, which um, Stephen touched on in, in his description of an earlier project, but it's also a way of dealing with the means of escape as well. The other alternative would have been to put in sprinklers. <laughs> so you can see as you go up through the plan, there's this deliberate intention to make the position of the stair shift until eventually you get onto the roof, which commands a view over the landscape. And the current status of the facades, which are looking at a very coarse concrete surface which has got flint in it like the main house that I was describing earlier. Nearly at the end, um, this is a project that's very, very much um, It's very important to me because it's in the, the city where I teach. I think the sort of sense of the responsibility and the possibility that as an office we can be contributing to the urban fabric of the city of Mendrisio is, of course, um, an important possibility. We won a competition um, three years ago. In Ticino, things move slowly. We're currently involved now in the, um, the work that is to do with the reforming of uh, the central public space at the center of Mendrisio, the piazza. And this image is a representation of an extraordinary moment in the annual life of the city where the Easter procession passes through the, the central piazza. And as an accompaniment to the, the work that's to do with the making of public space, there's also a, a a, a program of, of building that was part of the, um, the competition that we won. And the first building will be this rather punctual building, which will contain a level of public, um, public space, but it will also contain um, a hotel. And as someone who was staying in this city for five years, I think the need for a nice hotel was something I was certainly aware of. My anxiety, I, got, I must say, when this project is finished is that my colleagues will stay in the hotel and they'll complain about all sorts of things that they perceive as uh, a fundamental problem. But hoping that that doesn't happen, we move on. Um, this drawing locates the project within the wider urban tissue and at this, our work also involves the relationship or a a problematic relationship at the moment with this cantonal road which passes adjacently to the piazza and the main way as a pedestrian of moving through the city which is um, as I just indicated and in the Italian speaking world driving a car comes with <laughs> a sense of your place in the world and uh, at the moment we're trying to find a way of just relaxing that uh, need to give the accelerator and the horn more priority than uh, perhaps a break and uh, a sense of civic uh, 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 dignity. This is, is, again, part of the situation that we're working with, and in more detail, a kind of precision to the reorganization of the piazza and um, this first building that we're currently working on. But in, in our work, the 
is trying to find reference. We're very much drawing upon the elements that we find immediately around the site of this project. At ground floor level, the new building will have a, a cafe space that will service the hotel above and very importantly, be able to extend its offer and its life into the piazza. And at later stages, um, the building will extend and provide a level of um, additional retail space, uh, necessary parking provision, and uh, a, a level of apartment. These are plans that are exploring the idea of a hotel and a sense that within the plan, within the, the vagary of the shape of a plan, um, uh, a collection of uh, different rooms can be arranged. And this is again a rather optimistic depiction of the possibility of this project, one where it was never an, there's never an intention to somehow compete with the internationally um, known Locarno Film Festival, but I do very much enjoy the thought that uh, of a wonderful evening in Ticino, it would be possible to sit in this piazza and as a member of the community, partake in the watching of a film outside the building. Perhaps the working of a hotel at that moment won't be so successful. But And then very finally, an image that I know Stephen already showed, but a, a work that we um, recently undertook at a much larger scale, and we include this, even though I think these kinds of projects are always very, very difficult to describe, but a work that is looking at a much larger scale at um, a part of the city of Geneva, a city that through our building we invested a great deal of time in trying to get to know. And Geneva, like Zurich, has a need to build many, many thousands of new homes. The, the need for this, these two Swiss cities to expand is a very real one. And this competition that we're showing you, which was undertaken with Jean-Paul Jacot, is a project that would look over a period of some 15 or 20 years at a way of creating some 390,000 square meters of additional space comprising of a significant number of apartments and uh, office space as well as um, uh, a public building and um, retail facilities. The site lies adjacent to a very big highway that runs through the city. This is the River Ron and beyond here is um, the Lake of Geneva. And the site really tries to reconcile the geometries that exist in this place, a kind of convergence, and our own interest in a proposition which is really um, very much on the, the theme, the very theme of this, this talk, the, the notion of how we can meaningfully continue the elements that we uh, experience within the immediate environs of this, of this place. And how you do that is difficult because the overall impetus behind this work is uh, the need to increase density. And in our work, there is a, a reconciling between the way density can be increased by vert uh, constructing vertically, but also a sense that the elements of a European city can be employed in a way where the lodger, the colonnade, the courtyard as an organizing element can become part of the very logic of the way that we make a larger scale urban proposition. And then this final image just talks about the additive quality of this project where three towers within this cityscape of the iconic water, water shoot, the lake, the backdrop of the city, the sense in which the scale of this project and the impact that it would have on the city is understood at many, many levels. That wasn't really half an hour and half an hour. <laughs> but thank you very much for your attention.
I don't know if, if, if the, I mean, it's a little bit too late, but uh, maybe there are questions. Can we go? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have just one question with this last project and the, the project you are dealing with, with the students. Uh, there's a relationship among choosing the tower type coming here to the States with this project or just because it's in the States <laughs> <laughs> or both things? <laughs> Thank you. I must say, through our different teaching activities, Stephen in Munich and my own in, in Mendrisio, where for the last three years I've been dealing with high density, low rise as a theme in a series of different European cities, I feel that when the work is located in the North American city, it's exciting for us to, to explore with our students a very North American invention. And I've got to say, when we were thinking about the thematic structure of our, our teaching this semester, it certainly did have some impact upon the way we were thinking about this project. Um, what I must say we weren't terribly satisfied with as a, as, a, as a critique of this project was the sense that the high rise feels like an afterthought. I must say, in our mind, the ability to work with high rise buildings and courtyards feels like a very, very natural um, combination. Perhaps that argument needs to be made more explicitly, but yeah. Yeah, there's one, one question here. Hi, uh, thanks for the lecture. Um, when I look at your projects, I, I feel like I often see um, they fall into formally into two categories where there's uh, the one set of projects that are typically um, very sort of strong facades but regular or or sort of slightly irregular uh, and the form is regular and then there's a whole nother set which you've shown a few of the projects of and I know there's many more um, that show more of sort of a, I guess a formal exuberance um, and they seem to fall pretty distinctly in one or the two, one or the other. Uh, and just wondering if how you could talk about sort of how you um, work if you agree for one, uh, and how you sort of reconcile those two modes of working. Thanks. Thanks, Jasper, for asking the awkward question. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, you know, we should ask you to commentate generally on our work. I think you know it would be good. Because, of course, it's sometimes difficult to be so clear about those differences that you notice or these camps of work. Um, the conversation that we have is, is our work experimental enough? You know? Where is the opportunity to investigate formal ideas within often you know, big constraints either of competition or of real life practice with little budgets and things like that. And it's a kind of, that is a constant discussion that we have. And we don't sort of go, oh, this is a category A or a category B <laughs> project. It's very much about an opportunity uh, you can see in our work. It's, there are specific responses, you know, it's maybe you see consistencies with proportion and attitudes to detail, but, you know, it's occasional where I think uh, themes are almost transferred. I mean, I, I look at the early Belgian work and I sort of realised that we were really working out the brick pier and the rail, you know, and it happened to be two projects in a row and makes me feel nervous that they look so the same, you know, so similar. But, I mean, I think in the work of architecture, you know, in your future practice, just like ours, you're responding to circumstance and opportunity and we can reflect and sometimes project an intention and then reality steps in and uh, that creates a different path, you know. This would be my very strange answer to your 
very general question. <laughs> But if I, if I could just pick that up a bit as well, because, you know, this lecture has deliberately drawn upon the work that we're involved in, which you could say deals with programmatically the normative, the, the stuff that is the majority of any city. You know, 70% of any city is housing. And most of the fabric of a city is either housing or places of employment. And yet those moments, those special moments, surely should be where public buildings occur. You know, in history it was the church, the museum. In, at the end of the 19th century it was a railway station. And, you know, we ask ourselves, I think quite consciously, how loud a building should be because I, I feel that there is an agreed discomfort with a contemporary condition in, in architecture which is those normative programs that I'm describing have become far too loud and that when we look at what's happened in London in the last 20 years it, it's sort of heartbreaking in a way that it's so loud that it can't sustain itself and yet so many cities in the world are working in this way. And so I, I, I think that the, the question at its core rests with, well, where is our responsibility as architects? I think, you know, those rare moments where we've made more public buildings, I think there has been an intention to be more formally ambitious. But I, I think when you, when you look at a, a, a body of work that's dealing with particularly housing, the employment of repetition, the employment of slightly adjusted known forms or shapes is, is very knowingly employed. I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a very nice question, but I think perhaps we could have been broader in what we, we shared this evening to make that point perhaps more clearly. There was a, a museum that we were involved in making in, as a competition entry on an, an island that belongs to Denmark, where I remember that the, at the moment that Stephen and I decided to do that competition, there was a formal ambition that we brought to that work, which was very exciting. <laughs> we never got to build it, but I think in other ways we have um, through other projects. And I also remember the moment that we worked on that project came after a, a very exhaustive exploration of timber-based forms of construction. And this was a moment where we said to ourselves, weight and permanence should be also um, an idea, a thematic in our work here. But this building needs to look not only can, but it should look like it's going to last for a long, long time. Now, I was reminded in Stephen's talk that when you referred to 9H, on, con on continuity was the last lecture, that, uh, the, last, the, last book. the last book they made. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you were aware of the yeah. irony of that. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's lovely that... Um, Wilfred and Ricky and Ros never did anything together afterwards. <laughs> Any other question? I think. Well, I think it's enough. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much.